Good morning today. It's so good to be here to share the Word of God. Just one thought about Israel. Those of us that have been studying the Bible throughout the years know that Israel is going to be the centerpiece in the last battle that's ever fought on earth. Amen. They're going to be surrounded. And if you study the Bible, you will see that some of the nations, China, Russia, the Middle East, it's all there in the scripture at the end time. We're going to go, come together to come against Israel. So this is biblical prophecy being fulfilled. And so it's just signs of the times, the times that we are living in. And so it's good to know that we know that and that we pray for the nation of Israel who we love. <clears throat> so that's biblical prophecy. As we come nearing the end time, unless the Lord's coming is going to be tearing for quite a, quite a while. The signs today seem to be indicative that he's going to be coming back soon. I don't know when. But the signs are there. And if that's the case, don't look for things to get that good on this earth anymore. I'd like to tell you people, this world is not our final home. He said, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, because we'll overcome the world. So this morning, uh, my sermon sort of fits with all that, all that one. I'm going to be talking this morning about being prepared for resistance. Staying the course in the midst of all the tumult that's going on, all the confusion in America, all the violence, all the division that's going on. Once again, those are things that were pretty indicative of the end times that we're living in today. So we want to just make sure that we're all on the same page we don't forget who we are as the children of God, that we have a specific mission in the midst of all this mess. We have a purpose as the people of God, why we're here. I think this is probably, I used to hear a lot of you that are old time Christians, they used to speak about this is the most important, exciting time in history to preach the gospel. I think this is, in my lifetime, I've never seen things this bad, where in the book of Romans it says that people would invent new ways of sinning and encourage others to do so. And so we're so thankful that we know the Lord. But this sermon this morning is talking about being prepared for resistance. We always talk about preparation, but in the spiritual, being prepared for days like this, because there's a purpose why we exist as the church today. We are the hands of God extended. So I'm going to read this passage in Ezekiel 3, verses 1 to 11. Follow it closely with me, because some of it sounds strange. And I'll talk about that later. But please listen, because what I'm going to share this morning, for the most part, comes from these passages that came to Ezekiel the prophet. So listen to it very carefully because I'll refer to it, might necessarily show you on the wall anymore, but keep it in your mind, okay? The voice said to me, son of man, eat what I'm giving you, eat this scroll. Fill your stomach with this, he said. And when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. How could a scroll Tastes sweet as honey. Then he said, Son of man, go to the people of Israel and give them my messages. I am not sending you to a foreign people whose language you can't understand. No, I am not sending you to people with strange and difficult speech. If I did, they would listen. But the people of Israel, that's part of the reason they're suffering today, though we're praying for them, if they did, they would listen. But the people of Israel won't listen to you any more than they listen to me. For the whole lot of them are hard-hearted and stubborn. So that he was describing his people to the prophet, the condition that they were in. So then he comes up with the cure. So he says, but I have made you as obstinate and hard-hearted as they are. I have made your forehead as hard as the hardest rock. So don't be afraid of them or fear their angry looks, even though they are rebels. Then he added, Son of man, let all my words, which is the Bible, the scroll is represented. 
sink deep into your own heart first. Get the word in your heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself. Then go to the people in exile and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, do this whether they listen or not. Preparing him and preparing us today for resistance against the gospel. This scroll is the type or a symbol of the word of God, the Bible. And Cliff knows this and some of you probably others that have studied the word. I'm sure glad, Pastor Cliff, that God then asked us to do some of the things that he asked Ezekiel to do, like lay on your side for about a year with a tile. Uh, that poor man, first of all, his message was not received. And what God put that man through to use him as an object lesson for Israel, he had to ask him some strange things, but this man was obedient. And so when they talk about that scroll and all these different things, it is symbolic of the word of God, where we're going to be, he was living in a time when God's own people, Israel, and again, no judgment on them, but they, they have rejected the Messiah for the most part. That's part of the purpose of the tribulation when the 144,000 evangelists are going to go preach the gospel. Because of Israel, God's going to bail them out again, and Israel will be saved. The story is not over. In fact, if you look in the gospels, it says that we Gentiles who have been saved are supposed to be making Israel jealous to come after God, and they will in the future. So God is going to save Israel. But we think about these things today, and that's what we want to talk about, living in a day with all the chaos that we're in, that this message was originally intended for backslidden Israel, who had no problem listening to false prophets and false gods. And they rejected the truth of the gospel. In fact, well, we, we saw in the text what happened. And I feel today that there are those same anti-Christian, anti-Christ sentiments that are taking place in our world today that we need to be ready for as the children of God and to be ready up to stand up and to give a defense for the hope that is within us. And so that's part of the purpose of the sermon today. He said they're hard-headed and obstinate, but then he told Ezekiel, and he tells the church, I'm going to make your foreheads as hard as theirs. I want to put a stubbornness of standing the truth within my people. So God was implying that we have to stand strong today as in Israel's day to stand for the truth whether people want to hear it or not. We have a purpose to be here. We have a mission here that's a spiritual one. And he says, so we're going to, we're going to travel on this today First of all, the church will never be defeated. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So we don't have to worry, that, worry about that. But we are indeed involved in a spiritual battle. When we see things that are going crazy in the world, we know that there is an enemy in this world who is Satan, who is moving people. They don't realize they're using people to bring all the chaos in the world that we're in today. It is not flesh and blood. It is principalities and powers in high places. It is satanic. And we see what he's doing. You know, to parents, we have to be hard-headed and stubborn with our children and grandchildren and upholding the standards of the Word of God. There's some people that say, I've said it myself, I should be able to say it, I don't go for all that nonsense that's going on right now. They can all do what they want. I, I, I don't go for it. I know better. The devil knows that you know better, but they're sending this to your children. Right. And as I heard of somebody saying recently, one of these days those kids in your house and that Christian home are going to look at mom and dad in about five years and say, you know, mom and dad, you're kind of weird people. You're weird. You're trying to live by that Bible with all these things that we do and we don't do. And I've went out in the world and I've been indoctrinated by the world. So we have to be careful that as parents, our own foreheads and our stubbornness of will upholding the truth of God's word if we're going to save our children. So we want to get to the sermon today and realizing that we are kingdom people yes. with God's agenda. That is our primary purpose for the church it's spiritual work. 
following his agenda, not getting caught up with all the stuff we see in the news and we hear what's coming. You know, first of all, the Lord already told me all this was coming. Let's just take a quick view, spiritually speaking, prophetically speaking. Everywhere in the world is unrest. We'll get to the sermon. <laughs> no leader anybody's happy with on the planet right now, almost anywhere. Aren't we ripe for one world global leader? Who people are going to go after? It's called the Antichrist. And everyone's going to come after him. And he's going to bring peace for three and a half years. And he's going to change on everybody. When you talk about a monetary system. I won't be surprised after the rapture. That there will probably be a new system. It's going to be a different gig. I already know that. That's part of biblical prophecy. But my job today, and Cliff's job, is to preach the gospel of the kingdom, knowing no matter what the word pulls, we are God's people with God's agenda. And we are prepared to meet the challenge. And so the first thing he told the prophet was, eat the scroll. Chomp, chomp. Eat the word. What does the Bible say? Man shall not live by the bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Get that word into your system. And what did he say? Fill your stomach with it. Be people of the word. He wanted him to be filled with the word of God. He wants his church to be filled with the word of God and the Holy Spirit. So there is no room for other messages or voices to influence us. We have owned the word of God. We believe it is the word of God. What it says is right, we accept. What it says is wrong, we reject. We are filled with the word. So we need to be today to stand and to survive is to be filled with the word of God. Amen. People of the word. Yes. So no other thoughts will cross your mind. No other thoughts. He says when he ate that scroll, it became as sweet as honey. You know, there are parts of the Bible that a lot of us struggle with, with some of the commandments and stuff. And sometimes we even get hard-hearted and want to reject it. But when we own the scripture, when we realize that it's right, and we see that it is true, even the hard parts of the scripture we accept and it becomes sweet to us because we know it has been put there for our own good by our Father God. So the word of God becomes sweet. We have an appetite for it. We don't reject it. Even the parts that convict us, that's good because we are being convicted. What did Paul say? Without the law, I would never know I was a sinner. I wouldn't know what it would be to covet. We need the word of God. We need the people of prayer, but we need to be people of the Word. That's why you need to read it every day, even just for five minutes. Get into the Word of God, where it gets into your heart. and There's no room for anything else to come in there and take you away. One of the secrets to the success in our family, for the most part, when it came to salvation, is I'm talking about my original family I was born into, my mother and father lived the word. They were unyielding on the scripture. And because we saw that model before us, it impacted us powerfully. So when we went to school and heard strange stuff, we were not influenced by it because we had already been, as they used to say in the old days, rooted and grounded in the word of God. It was a part of our lives. Now, did we always fulfill it? Not for, some of us slipped from it. But we had that in our system and we got back to it because we saw it, it was lived out in front of us. It becomes sweet. We're not at odds with the scripture. But we see today that there are even Christians that are compromising their faith because they don't want to obey that part. But I would tell you this, like I often mention my brother Reuben, to him a disciple was a convinced learner. Are you convinced of the truth of the Bible? Do you really realize it? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you do, you'll be able to stand for the gospel. If you do not get solid in the word of God, it'll be very hard for you to stand. What does the Bible say? To always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you. Within you. To defend your faith because it's in you. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Kept in a special place. And we're talking about fresh manna too. Every day, ever so often, 
reading a new thought that God has given to you as you begin to grow. We don't want to live on yesterday's manna. Current hearing for the Bible. However, as we're talking about being prepared for opposition, we do not want to condemn the world. We don't want to denounce them. But we want to engage the world, which means live a Christ-like life in front of people. And every time you have an opportunity to interject the truth of the gospel in a loving way, do that. Do that. Don't view them as the enemy. You know, my dad used to say that every man that was ever created on earth, saint or sinners, are brothers by virtue of being created by God the Father. So even those unsaved people, God created them too. They're our brothers and sisters because our God created them. So how we approach them, we're not going to hit the streets and carry signs unless God calls us to do that and, and just be in people's face and brandishing all our beliefs and condemning people, ramming it down their throats. We don't do that. But when we get an opportunity, do you know today just being friendly is a great witness? Yeah. Smiling at somebody is a great witness? Obey the word. Be people of the word. Own the scripture. And so we look also that he was sent to people who wouldn't believe and accept what he said. God said they were hard-headed and stubborn. We expect opposition. He said, if I spoke to them, they wouldn't listen. They're not going to listen to you either. It didn't sound, like I've said in recent weeks, like in a very attractive call to ministry. He says, you will have little or no success. And so we have to look at it today, knowing that we do our best and we leave the rest to God. All you have to do is plant the seed in your schools with your students, having a smile, treating them with respect, no matter how they act. You might have to correct them, do whatever you have to do today. But for the most portion, how you deal with people around you, whether they accept or reject, live the life of Jesus before you. And you know one of the good things about it? There are people today that are still open to the gospel. I was just even talking in the early morning prayer meeting this morning about we talk about how our young people are going crazy. Our young people are looking for direction. They're looking all over the world and they see this and can you blame them? And then God help a lot of our parents. We haven't raised them the right way. Can you blame them? I believe they're looking for purpose in their lives. They're trying to find something. <clears throat> but they don't really hear it from the top officials in the country. They don't really hear it among so many people that are among. They're just among all of us and all the stuff that's going on. There are no longer any moral absolutes, right and wrong. Do what you please. That's what they're dealing with today. And so I challenge young people to have the courage to be like a Daniel in your school, in your neighborhood. Purpose in your heart not to defile yourself. You know better. Your parents have taught you a better way. They have taught you better. Stand up. But they need to be encouraged to stand. And I pray that God would raise up youth leaders in our country that are going to challenge us. Because you know, everybody wants to be different today, right? Even crazy different. Well, why can't you be crazy different for Jesus? You know, when I was a Christian in 1950, Janine, everybody was kind of good. No one was acting crazy in the classroom. We respected authority. The movies were like they are today. It was Mickey Mouse. But today, you see crazy. So why can't you be crazy for the Lord? I'm talking with your enthusiasm and with your energy and with your purpose. I don't say you have to look weird. Please, <laughs> please don't do that. You can dress fashionably, fix yourself up nice, be, be presentable, but be different in the way you act and conduct yourself and show those other students. We have a, not gonna mention a family that used to be coming to the church. They were over at Banning High School and they were in high school. These girls were athletes. And a lot of the girls at Banning High School were doing crazy. 
So they got after these two girls. I think Janine knows who they are. They got after these two girls. And they said, you know, you're just mama's girls. You won't go to this party, because they knew everybody was going to be going there and getting drunk and getting high. And you know what one of those girls said? You need to be some mama's girls. Your mother should be teaching you how to live right. We don't do that. And see, that came from two athletes. One of them was at all, C all City in soccer. Quiet girls, quiet girls, not loud, not talking, look very, what do you call today when you're trendy, you're dressed? They're cool. <laughs> but man, when you talk to them about doing crazy, they told them girls, too bad you didn't have a mother to teach you how to live. You wouldn't be in the mess that you're in. And I was so proud of those girls. Two quiet girls. So it's not a mouth thing. It's a life thing. It's how people see you. When people want to know and have a defense for the hope that's in you, you don't have to be loud and crazy. Be, in fact, I would be normal. But let your life speak volumes and loud. I never forget that. He says, you girls need a mother to teach you how to behave. God has prepared us to be people to share the gospel in times like this. Remember when we preached last Sunday, we're all good to go. You don't think you have enough? You have enough. God has seen enough in you. You have what is necessary to get the job done for him. We talked about that. Spiritually speaking, using the symbolism of the scripture, we need to be ready to butt heads with the enemy. And I already told you how, not in an ugly way, to engage, to live it. This is not a battle of flesh and blood. The spiritual battle will be won by the word, the full armor of God, and the arena of prayer. We are not powerless. And when we see the damage that the enemy is doing today, if we are not careful, we can tend to become faint-hearted. But that won't be happening. You know, there's a place for anger. There's a place for righteous indignation, not to smash things and break things down. But to be angry, what, aren't you angry what the devil is doing to our country? To our ch doesn't it make you mad? Well, when you turn that anger into positive power to the Holy Spirit, to live right and do all you can to direct others to do the same thing, to be able to stand and go on the offensive, not just ready for the attack, but to be ready to bring the attack to the enemy in a loving way. You know, I think of the power that we have in Christ. I used to idolize, well not idolize, respect General Douglas MacArthur, Eisenhower, people of my past, and who wouldn't love General George Patton, right Jose? I like when he went to the hospital tent and there was a coward and they just put him on the front lines. Those of you who've never been there won't appreciate that, but I loved it. He was scared, okay? But in Joshua 5, 13 to 15, Joshua, a warrior, one day before he goes to battle at Jericho, he encounters a spiritual encounter. He says, are you friend or foe, Joshua asks. Neither one, he replies, I am the commander of the Lord's army. He was a friend of Israel because this was Israel's God made visible to Joshua. But what he was saying, I bring to the conflict the power of heaven's army. You're going to be fighting, you're going to be shouting around that wall. But I have what it takes to push you to victory. The same thing that he said to Gideon last week, who thought he was nothing. The power of God was going to move through them. And I was thinking this morning, as a side thought just came to my mind, we often think about the Holy Spirit, and it kind of ties in with what I'm saying today in standing firm and in sharing the gospel. In the Pentecostal church, and rightfully so, we're so proud of the fact that we have the gifts of the Spirit, we have the gifts of tongues of God has blessed us with that interpretation, and words of knowledge and stuff like that. But do you know the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit, what he came? He came with dynamis power. He made world evangelism possible. Why do you think Jesus said, I've got to go? The anointed one. I've got to go so the Holy Spirit can come. It was urgent. 
Jesus could only reach so many in his lifetime. But he says, I'm going to send one. The Holy Spirit is going to baptize you with fire. The Holy Spirit's primary purpose, he is the convictor of sin. He is the only one that can change people's lives. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Jesus was around the disciples. But when Peter preached, filled with the Spirit of God, 3,000 were saved. And a few days later, four or 5,000 were saved. The Holy Spirit brought the power for world evangelism. And that is the power that we have if we're going to stand today. That's the power of the Holy Spirit that I'm looking for. Because I'll tell you, I think sometimes it's easier for God to heal a cancer in a body than to heal some people to change their lives. Really? And it takes the power of God to convict people of their sin. The power of the Holy Spirit. We don't give him enough credit. If we do, we, we only emphasize tongues and stuff. You, don't, you forget. He made it possible for mass evangelism. Because he convicts people. He convicts me when I get off the path. He is with me all the time. He makes the difference. So the power that the Holy Spirit gives us to advance the gospel to stand firm but lovingly. And so we often ask the question, why does God want us to keep on sharing the gospel when there is so much resistance and opposition? This is our mission that God has given us today, church. Yes. This is where we need to see the eternal perspective. Ezekiel 2, 5. And whether, this is for us today, this could be for some of your relatives and my relatives that up to this point are still rejecting. And whether they listen or refuse to listen, for remember, they are rebels. At least they will know they have a prophet among them. They have the voice of God among them. I was thinking an uh, illustration that was going through the church years ago. There was a story about a young boy who came to a beach that was thousands of starfish were stranded on the beach. And he was walking around throwing one by one all back into the ocean. And somebody asked him, what are you doing? Do you think you can save all of those starfish? And he said, no. But everyone that I save is going to still live. And that's the mentality that we have to do in the gospel today. Even in sales, years ago, 20 leads, 20 contacts to make one sale. They say the average Christian was witness, I forgot how many times, maybe seven times, before he finally made a commitment to Christ, which means that six or seven or 10 or 12 other people before you came along, planted the gospel, you watered it, years later, and God gave the increase. Yes. So don't think you've got to close the deal. See, that's what scares more people. Oh, they're going to reject the gospel. First of all, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting the gospel. And if you do it in a kind way, you're not going to offend them anyway. You see, I'm just telling you this to help you because I love you. Stick with the message. Plant the seed. Leave the rest to God because that's when the Holy Spirit is going to convict their hearts. And that seed that you planted. There are some of you here that are seated here today that probably were witnessed to by a grandmother and you didn't accept the Lord right away. You might have went into the world. I know there's a few in here that probably that has happened. But throughout the years, some people came along and watered that seed that was planted. Someone had the courage to approach you way back then and you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior because the Holy Spirit, the convictor, touched you. And that's why we can pray and believe God for the salvation of our families. Just believe God that no matter what, I'm going to continue to pray for these children and grandchildren. And when that trumpet sounds, if I'm faithful, they're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord and at least they will know in the day of judgment, that there was a prophet who stood among them. And let that be you and me today. Throughout history and centuries, there were hundreds of years where darkness thrived. And I believe it's true today that there was always a remnant. You see that in Israel? You see that throughout history? through the Dark Ages, the Reformation, the Crusades, all that mess that we went through, there was always a remnant of believers in that time that stood for the gospel. 
Then we had the Reformation in the 14th, 15th century. Began to realize that the saved were saved by faith in Christ alone. There were centuries and years of darkness, but there was always somebody standing. And so when we look at the big picture today, here we are in 2023. We are God's representatives on earth. We really are. You might go home and eat your Big Mac, you know, and you'll forget everything I said. But get this in your head. We are the church. We are the army of the Lord. We are his hands extended. We are his feet extended. We have been called to preach the precious gospel to reach others for the Lord. That is my mission today. That's Cliff's mission today. That's our church's mission today to prepare you spiritually. Because who else is preaching what we're preaching? If we get cut up in all the politics that's going on way out there, see, that's another trick of the enemy. He wants me to start focusing on that so I'll forget about this. It's, think of it. He'll use whatever tool he can use to get you thinking about that stuff out there. Oh, this is happening. That's ha I know it's happening. But I also know my Heavenly Father watches over me. I'm not going to worry about that stuff. I have to worry about this. This is my, when I took English class writing, there was always this thesis statement. Of, what is your specific purpose in writing this paper? What is your specific purpose as a Christian? Is it to get entangled in all that nonsense that's going out there? It's to be committed to what the Bible says, and this will take care of what's going on out there. Because yes. he'll give you wisdom yes. in how to live your life on earth right now, and we go to God. You know, I love the Bible in Acts 13, 36, and you can stand to your feet right now. I got an early start. I'm going to end, too. I ain't going to take advantage of it, Cliff, and go to 11 o'clock because you <laughs> gave me 45. We're still going to stick to what? Okay. Your attention spans are only so long anyway, right? <laughs> That's the truth. We're human. For after David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. In other words, his body decayed. And I pray today that every one of you that's here, that's been my life's purpose as a pastor, to serve my generation. That's why God put me here. It was never an occupation. It was a call from the Lord. Because if it isn't a call, you're, you're a hireling. It's not just the, the ministry is a little bit different. And I believe, too, that school teachers are called. I really, because if I wouldn't have been a pastor, I would have been a school teacher. Or a lawyer. I've thought about two things. <laughs> But those two things were always... But God didn't put me there. He called me to share the gospel with anybody I know. And I try to do my best to do that. Because I want God to bless you. And I want us all to be people of the word and to be blessed. So what have we learned today? We've got to get the word into our hearts and own it. We're going to be sharing the gospel with those that will refuse. God has prepared us to meet that challenge. We are not to be deterred by opposition. We are on a mission. Embrace it. Father, we come to you this morning. I pray for this precious congregation. I see some people here, Lord, that have been with, been with me for over 30 years. There's a few. Lord, and I pray to God that I've been able to direct them in the right direction. That's always been my purpose. I didn't always do it perfectly, but I did the best that I could. But I pray, Lord, that within our hearts, help us not to be discouraged by what the enemy is doing and to get caught up on all that nonsense. Help us to focus on our mission. When Sarah and the young people go to school, she knows that she's in the world, but not of the world. That doesn't mean she's weird and can't join any clubs or have any fun, no. She just knows where to draw the line. The same thing with the adults when they go to work. We don't have to get weird and and necessarily have 10 Bibles on our desk. We just need to live the Bible because the Bible said we are epistles written of God in our hearts, Amen. not with pen and ink. We are the gospel yes. in front of people. Yes. So help us to be that today. And Lord, when I talk about pre prepared for op opposition, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying there's going to be resistance. And if it gets tough, you will be with us. You will provide. You will direct. You will be everything to us. And so help us to stand firm, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Bless us today. 
And that's often as Mark says in our prayer meetings on Sunday morning, he says, may we not go out the same way as we came in. And I pray for every sermon that's preached here that this will not just be words, but they will be life-changing words that will change the way we conduct our lives where necessary or encourage us to continue on the right path we're on. That is my heart's desire. I know that's Pastor Cliff's desire. I know that's the desire of every elder in this church is if we turn out people who are people of the gospel who not only speak it, but more than that, live it to the best of the ability. In Christ, we are more than conquerors. And even what's happening in Israel today, we know that this is just the signs of the end times. It says it will be like birth pangs as the coming of the Lord is sooner. We're going to see more and more things that are going to be more painful. But you will see us through. To victory, amen. God bless you. God bless you.